Hi folks, Rob Eger here of CollativeLearning.com and I want to talk to you today about a very interesting and unusual murder case, a very brutal one, that took place in Australia in the 1990s. As you can see from the title of the video, uh, this is about the Snowtown murders. Now, there's a lot of um, videos out there on YouTube at the moment on this subject which cover the case very briefly but don't really give much in the way of insights into uh, what happened or even pose particularly interesting questions. A lot of the videos are just sort of uh, sensationalist serial killer true crime stuff, you know, a bit of background dramatic music, some gritty photos, and just reciting the details of who was killed and how they were killed and stuff like that. I don't really want to go down that sensationalist route with this video. I want this to be more educational because I think there's a lot of important things can be learned from this case. Um, and you know, a lot of important learnings about human behavior and uh, psychology can be, can be learned more from the extremes of human behavior because a lot of what we do in life is kind of covered over by false motives at certain times and uh, distracting motives. It's very hard to pinpoint the motivation be behind a particular behavior. But when you get to a really extreme set of behaviors like what you get in this Snowtown murders case, it's kind of like a lot of the, the false justifications get stripped away and what is underneath gets shown for what it is. Uh, so I think the Snowtown Murders has a lot of value in that respect and we'll get more into that as we go along. Now before I carry on, I just want to mention that you're going to be seeing some sort of stills and footage in this video which isn't from the actual real case but is from the movie Snowtown uh, which you know is the the screen version of this case uh, with actors and all the rest of it and so what you're going to be seeing in this video footage that I'm going to be using to illustrate certain points in the video I just want you to know outright that that is not the real case you're not looking at the real killers uh, you're looking at footage from that movie because it was the Snowtown movie that got me interested in this case in the first place okay so a very basic outline of the case I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail because a lot of the detail isn't necessary uh, to get the points across that I want to make in this video. Uh, the leader of this serial killer episode was a guy called John Bunting. He's now uh, in prison almost certainly until the day he dies in Australia. It would be insane to let this guy out of prison ever for any reason. Uh, John Bunting was the ringleader of this group of people in a, a small town in Australia, which by the way wasn't Snowtown. Snowtown is a an, a different place where some of the bodies were stored uh, after they killed them and then they called them the Snowtown murders on account of that but the murders didn't take place in Snowtown. So John Bunting led this group of people in this impoverished neighborhood uh, in nearby Adelaide in South Australia um, and Adelaide is renowned by the way for uh, having a lot of serial murder, a lot of um, child killings and so on and there's been rumors going around in Australia for a long long time that in Adelaide there is a high group of pedophiles or paedophiles as we call them in Britain um, who operate in Adelaide and kill young boys and young men and so on and um, that's an important little piece of background regarding all this so John Bunting uh, sort of emerged in that kind of environment uh, impoverished environment where Paedophilia was considered to be a huge uh, social problem and it was so in the news media as well as at the local level. And in the community where these murders happened, uh, there was a lot of paedophilia if you read about the actual circumstances that the case uh, took place. And so what John Bunting did was he sort of came into this community and he offered himself up to some of the locals as being this sort of saviour, this hero who was going to um, take care of all the paedophile problems in the community and the community sort of viewed it that the police weren't really helping um, or may have even been covering up for some of these paedophiles and you know a lot of these people are like oh our kids are getting raped, abused, molested, whatever so in comes John Bunting, I'll bloody take care of this mate so he offers himself up as a saviour and he talks a lot about uh, to these people he talks about killing the paedophiles as a way of dealing with them and he sort of gets them all on board gradually uh, but he talks a hell of a lot to them about torturing not just killing but torturing 
at these paedophiles um, in the most horrific ways. And he very slowly manipulates all these people into being pro-torture and pro-murder, uh, which is unbelievable. And so uh, then it happened. <laughs> the, the, the murders were committed uh, over the course of, I think it was 10 or 12 years. Most unbelievably horrific uh, forms of torture were committed on these victims. And at least some of these victims were actually paedophiles. Uh, and so some would argue that, you know, some of these people deserve to die for being paedophiles. A lot of people hold that view. If somebody's a paedophile, execute them. A lot of people hold that view. But these people took it way further than that. They took it to a level of torture that is just virtually incomprehensible. It's hard to imagine uh, what they did to these people, but if you read about the details, it's really horrific. And yeah, this went on for 10, 12 years. And um, John Bunting had, uh, I believe it was three accomplices who assisted him in these murders. And each one had a different level of involvement. And the main accomplice was a guy called Robert Wagner, who uh, John Bunting had befriended this guy. And the guy was, he was a little bit stupid, to be honest. If you read about the guy, he wasn't very bright at all. He was probably easy to manipulate in that respect. And uh, John Bunting persuaded him to take thoroughly take part in these murders and help plan the murders. Uh, very detailed planning went into it, but John Bunting was the brains. And uh, this Robert Wagner guy, would uh, he was basically a henchman who helped carry it all out. Um, and then one of them was a, a younger lad called Jamie Vlasakis. Uh, John Bunting had had a relationship with uh, Jamie's mother and he'd gradually groomed Jamie into this uh, utter hatred of paedophiles and this desire to torture and murder them. And, uh, and then there was a, another guy uh, who had a lesser involvement and I don't consider this, this fourth person to be uh, of particular importance. He was kind of stupid and easily dragged along with it. Um, just like a milder version of Robert Wagner, I suppose. So anyway, that, that was the, the basic four who uh, committed these murders. Oh, and by the way, Jamie Vlasakis's mother, uh, whose name was Elizabeth, I think it was, she assisted in at least one of the murders, I believe. And if I remember rightly, it was a pedophile who had apparently abused her kids so she assisted in his killing, uh, if I remember. I might be wrong on some of these details. Well, that's the general outline. This went on for years. People would be uh, chained up in bathtubs and brutally tortured for hours and eventually killed. And there was a lot of domination, humiliation involved in how these people were treated uh, in the lead up to their death. But things get even more sinister than that as the, the years go by. Initially, it's a sort of crusade against paedophiles, take revenge against them, stop them from ever doing it ever again. And there's a kind of social justice framing to it, although the torture is still, you know, pretty hard to condone. But at least you can appreciate there was some reason for what they did. But as the years went on, the reasons for killing people became more obscure. It stopped being just about protecting kids from paedophiles and it started being well, he's gay, let's kill him, he's homosexual. And homosexuals are, according to these guys, uh, abusers of children by default. So they associated um, pedophiles and homosexuals as one and the same, basically. So they would start killing homosexuals just because they were homosexual. Um, and one of the victims was a homosexual who was actually uh, mentally disabled or whatever the politically correct term is that is used these days, learning disabilities, whatever, these terms change all the time. But anyway, this guy was mentally disabled, but the fact that he was um, gay was enough for them to say, right, this guy needs to be tortured and murdered. So they did that. Um, and the very last victim that they did, or at least the last victim that is known that they did, uh, was actually the stepbrother of Jamie Vlasakis. And Jamie Flosakis helped them to trap this guy 
and then allowed him to be tortured and murdered. But this guy wasn't a homosexual, he wasn't a pedophile, he was just what John Bonson called a yuppie, you know? Uh, he was... So, so basically, it, it shifted from the paedophilia to let's kill homosexuals, and then it started breezing into, oh, this person's annoyed the hell out of us, we don't like this person, let's just torture and kill them. Oh, this guy's a yuppie, uh, he thinks he's better than us because he's got more money than us, let's torture and kill him. So you can see the, the gradual shift over the years from a social justice crusade to a an all-out bloodbath of just sadism, basically. So the case is very unusual for the fact that most serial killers operate alone. Uh, most of them uh, are not don't really have the kind of social knack that John Bunting had. But this guy... Uh, as a rarity, managed to persuade others to help him with these crimes. And uh, it went on for years. And they were talking in the local community with people sitting around, just gabbing with neighbours and stuff about killing paedophiles. And nobody ever went to the fucking police. Uh, it was just kept quiet. And whether the neighbours all completely understood that this stuff was really going on uh, is a, a big mystery in this case. Um, so, yeah. It's very interesting on those levels. So I think a lot of stuff can be learned from this case. So that's that's the basic outline. Now the level of cruelty that these people uh, plunged to in how they committed these murders, it really, really defies belief. I mean, I've read a lot of true crime stuff throughout my life. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm 47 years old. I've learned a lot about how uh, cruel human beings can be, uh, but this case uh, particularly shocked me and I would say there are probably about three or four cases that I consider to be the worst that I've ever read and this is certainly one of them uh, and so I'm not going to go into all the, the details of exactly what they did to the victims because some of it is really sickening and once you hear it you kind of wish that you hadn't heard it but I think it is important to note that there was a very very strong sexual element to how these people were tortured and killed um, as far as I know, none of the victims were actually raped, but they were sexually tortured. And that's an interesting aspect of this that will come in strongly later. Now, the first important lesson that I've taken from the Snowtown murders and everything I've read about it is what I'll call vindictive justice or the victim pass. And basically what I mean by this is that somebody starts off with a, a sort of a social justice motivation. I want to prevent paedophiles from raping kids. That's a very admirable motive. You know, it's like, yeah, you know, it's one of the worst problems in the world today is uh, the abuse of children. It's funny that like we we live in this society that prioritizes that says that racism is the worst thing in the world. No, I would say uh, the abuse of children is an even worse problem than that. But it doesn't get enough attention. But clearly. It's an issue that angers a hell of a lot of people. A lot of people are concerned about it. And, uh, well, a social justice issue like that can initially seem very noble and, you know, we're doing the right thing. Um, and as time goes on, uh, the, the people who engage in the crime spree, they, they use that as a justification, as a pass, in order to commit crimes themselves which are truly horrific, uh, which can be truly horrific. And so it seems to me that what happens is that they start off with the social justice motive and gradually as they begin to perceive the world in a sort of black and white, here's the victims, here's the perpetrators point of view, they become more and more and more angry about the social justice issue. And this can happen for an individual or for, for a group, but I'm just talking at the individual level at the moment. And so the anger builds up and up and up and up and then the rationality starts to disappear and the intensity of the anger becomes the key motivating drive and uh, they begin to fantasize about violence you know here's the victims here's the perpetrators and the person who follows this path of thought they may perceive themselves as the victim or they may perceive somebody else or some other group of people as the victim but either way, the anger can be pretty intense. And so the anger begins to replace the social justice motive over time. And it becomes a case of 
the aim of the crimes is the expression or release of intense anger, rage, hatred, uh, even sadism. And the social justice stops being the motive, but consciously the criminal continues to believe that they're serving the social justice uh, motive. And so this particular pattern is very, very strong in the Snowtown Murders case because, as I've already mentioned, they started off with a very clear social justice motive. There were paedophiles living in the community where these people lived and they wanted to get them out of the way and stop the kids being abused. Absolutely fine. Totally get it. But they ended up brutally torturing and murdering people who weren't even paedophiles anyway. Now, linking in with this uh, vindictive justice motive, that, that, that particular key pattern, is uh, the issue of reinforcement, how these kinds of beliefs get reinforced. Now, we all know a little bit about this anyway, about how uh, the news media, if they keep saying certain things over and over again, it convinces you to believe it. Um, and we, we all know a little bit about groupthink, although it's amazing how many people are aware of these concepts and yet still fall for the trap Lots of people I know will talk about, oh yeah, yeah, groupthink, and uh, people just follow what the news media says, and then they will come straight out with other points of view on particular subjects that are plucked straight from news media repetition that, that they've experienced themselves. So they're aware of the pattern, and yet they still fall into the trap. I see that with a lot of issues. But... Uh, this case is, a, 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 I think, is a good one for further exploring how uh, reinforcement of these vindictive justice motives can happen at the group level. Now, for me, there's two major types of groupthink. One is groupthink by news media. Uh, you know, people see the same thing said on television over and over again by lots and lots of different people or in the newspapers. And the more journalists are saying this particular thing and the more guests on TV talk shows are saying it, the more they believe it because they begin to think, well, if all of the news media thinks that, then obviously most people do, which is not necessarily the case. There's a lot of issues where the news media holds certain views and the vast majority of the population thinks something different. And it's very easy for people to forget that when they get drawn into these news media things. But this particular case isn't really about that. Uh, this case is more about groupthink at the actual contact level between people who actually see each other in the flesh, hang out together in real life. And that can be pretty powerful too, uh, in a different way. Um, and so basically, if you get a group of people who hang out together all the time and they all speak the same language and say the same things, express the same values, and that there's a peer pressure between them to adopt these um, uniform values and beliefs among them, uh, that's exactly what you get with the, the Snowtown situation. And John Bunting was clearly far more intelligent than pretty much all of the accomplices who he persuaded into committing these murders. He knew how to manipulate them. Um, and well, there, there's two aspects from what I can see of how he did that. One was conviction. He knew how to speak with absolute conviction about what he believes. Um, you know, if someone disagreed with him, he would be very, very firm and direct and even aggressive. Uh, and he'd also be very uh, intelligent and more, more articulate than the people he was recruiting. So that combination of factors gave him this psychological power to dominate and control and shape these people's minds. But also important was repetition. He would repeat these messages to people over and over and over again. I'm not saying that he was a hypnotist. I think he was genuinely expressing a lot of his own anger and his beliefs. But the repetition and the conviction um, and the higher articulation that he had, that combination of factors over time, especially the repetition, gradually twisted these people's minds. Uh, and again, that's something I find absolutely amazing as well, is how both at the... the um, the local groupthink level of people who actually know each other and at the news media groupthink level, repetition is so powerful. You know, something gets said on one occasion and people go, oh, yeah, okay, well, I don't, I'm not sure if I agree with that. And then they go away and it plays on their mind subconsciously. And then they hear it a few more times in the media. What? Why am I hearing this again? And then they start hearing it all the time and then it just fucking sinks in and controls them. And, you know, John Bunting managed to do that with these people. 
And it's amazing that this kind of vindictive justice um, mindset can be instilled in people with either forms of groupthink on almost any subject. You can persuade people that gay people are horrible, low-life degenerates who should be executed. You can persuade people uh, to torture and murder paedophiles. Um, but this can happen with many, many other different types of things. Um, the most horrific human behaviour can be, for a lot of people, uh, framed as being a form of justice if you repeatedly tell them it and you apply groupthink and group pressure to get them over a period of time into that mindset. And it's amazing how uh, this kind of stuff can override sensory evidence. You know, you can <laughs> persuade people with groupthink and reinforcements and stuff to believe things that are absolutely contradicted by sensory evidence in the real world. Persuade people to believe things that absolutely defy their real sensory experience. Now there's many, many uh, historical examples of this at the small and large level. And I'll just mention a few. I mean, I've got, some, I've got some notes here that I made in order to make this video because I want to try and keep things as concise as I can. Um, I'll just mention a few of them. So obviously we've got the Nazis with the group think and the, the, the level of cruelty that they went to. You know, that's a large scale group think. And that would involve like uh, news media and government um, peer pressure. Uh, but also that would sink down to the um, to the person to person level. It, be, it would become a group think at that level as well. So you know the Nazis is the very obvious historical example everybody likes to use. On the, the smaller level, we've got the murder of Thomas Vigliarolo. I think that, I think that's how you pronounce pronounce his name. Uh, Thomas Vigliarolo was a a gay businessman, and I believe it was New York. Uh, going back to 1970s, 1980s. Well, anyway, he was abducted and tortured and murdered. And if I remember rightly, the torture went on for several weeks. Um, and he was abducted by a group of people who... I, I can't remember what the motive was. I can't remember if it was, they hated him because he was gay, or they hated him because he was white, or they hated him because he was a businessman. It might have been a combination of all three. Um, but... Yeah, they committed this unbelievably horrific crime, which was probably as brutal and harsh as what the Snowtown murders involved. And uh, again, there was sexual torture in that scenario. But these people believed that they were carrying out a social justice uh, cause. You know, they, they viewed him as some sort of social justice enemy. And um, one of the, the people who took part in uh, those murders, Donna Hilton, she is now a famous women's rights activist, and yet she committed these horrendous acts against this guy, this torture and murder of this guy. I don't think she was the ringleader, but she definitely took part in it. And um, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, the person who has committed a crime like that has got no right running around uh, claiming to stand up for rights for anything, for anyone. You know, it's. Um, but anyway, yeah, that, that that's an example, and um, it's it's strange that a lot of people in the the feminist movement have accepted Donna Hilton into their crowd and let her do speeches and stuff, despite the fact that she tortured and murdered a man, you know. So uh, other examples would include here in Britain we had the murder of Chris Donald. Um, this guy was abducted and murdered purely because of his race. The people who did it. Uh, they had a problem, they felt that people were being racist towards them um, and they abducted and murdered Chris Donald, tortured him for hours and he was only 15 years old and he was a complete stranger and they abducted him purely because of the, his skin colour and tortured and murdered him. Uh, yeah, so that's another crazy example. Uh, we also have a, a, a prisoner in the British system here who is... Uh, currently locked away in a, um, a sort of a glass cage type cell, completely kept away from everybody uh, because he has a, a complete and utter hatred of paedophiles and whilst in prison um, for murder he 
managed to barricade himself uh, in a, a cell or a or an office with another paedophile prisoner uh, and him and another prisoner they spent nine hours torturing uh, and killing this guy they barricaded the doors so nobody could get in so be, because he's committed those types of crimes he's not allowed to see anybody uh, publicly uh, that's not really a group thing thing well I, I guess actually there is an element to it because two prisoners committed that act but again you know we've got the same thing hatred social justice yeah paedophile terrible horrible people uh, and yet goes to the absolute depths of depravity and becomes an even worse criminal than the criminal who they are fighting against and uh, serial killers in general uh, tend to have a kind of false social justice framing a lot of serial killers are very angry at society because of uh, ways that they feel that they've been treated and a lot of them have been treated really badly you know you know terrible parenting abuse as children stuff like that um, being treated with cruelty and uh, humiliated continuously for years by their peers in school or, or by own family members and a lot of serial killers they really do have very uh, good gripes against the world but the level that of um, revenge that they go to is just way out of proportion to what they've experienced themselves and the last major example I want to give there is the war on terror um, you know we had this way back after the September 11th attacks and suddenly it was terror 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 and the social justice cause of stopping terrorism was absolutely hammered in the news media for years and it was used um, it, it was used as a justification for for wars that were probably unnecessary uh, it was used to bring in all kinds of you know surveillance laws and stuff like that and the motives may have been quite genuine at the beginning but after time it became obvious that um, the motive of stopping terrorism stopped being the issue and the power that was gained from the social justice cause you know being able to have more control over people more surveillance more wars against uh, countries that uh, the, the the war on terror perpetrators wanted to attack all of that became the forefront and the actual idea of stopping terrorism was no longer the issue and uh, I mean I'm not talking from any kind of uh, political left versus right or party political allegiance allegiance or anything like that I mean you know it was the Republicans who initially started all that war on terror stuff and then it continued under Obama anyway except it wasn't as um, it wasn't as in your face in the media but it still did continue um, and you know that's that's a very big example of a group think where you know initial social justice tends to anger and uh, uh, and secondary gains it's like oh hang on this social justice cause we actually gain things from this that are nothing to do with the social justice and then the secondary gains become the first gains and the original social justice cause becomes a background issue becomes an excuse basically so yeah, loads of historical examples of this stuff going on where a social cause is pursued and the people who are pursuing the social cause, uh, which usually involves um, preventing some other type of criminal from committing crimes, uh, the people who pursue that cause end up becoming even worse criminals than the people who they're trying to stop. Or in some cases, they actually become the same type of criminal as the ones that they're trying to stop. So you get your war on terror and it, it, it eventually became we have to engage in terrorism to stop terrorism you know that type of thing but then there's a variation on all this that's more sinister which i'll call the justice cover uh, which basically means that the person in, engaging in the crime or the group of people knew right from the outset that they weren't even pursuing a social justice cause in the first place the aim was to commit the crime, um, the horrific crime, for very selfish, immoral reasons, and they knew it right from the beginning, and the social justice excuses were simply made up or adopted in order to persuade others to commit similar crimes or to accept them doing it. Um, and yeah, John Bunting, as the leader of this group, appears to have been that kind of person. I think he knew at the outset that he didn't just want to torture and kill paedophiles, he wanted to torture and kill anybody he didn't like for any reason. Um, and one of the giveaways seems to be that um, he emphasised in his conversations with other people 
the torture element. I mean, from reading about this case. Oh, oh by the way, I mean, I've, I saw the movie first, the Snowtown movie, and that got me interested in the case. Um, I explored the um, the online news reports about it and some documentaries. And then I went and read uh, a book that was all about it that was pretty good, that went into a lot of detail. And then I went and read some of the court documents on the case. So that, that was my gradual process for how I learned about this case. But anyway, from all that, um, there, were, there were factors that made it very clear to me that John Bunting always just wanted to torture and kill people indiscriminately. And uh, one of them was that he worked in an abattoir, uh, you know, slaughtering animals. <clears throat> and a lot of reports... Uh, from people who knew John Bunting, uh, he apparently talked to people a lot about how much he loved slaughtering the animals in the you know the the abattoir, and he would talk about the ways he did it, and um, you know utter hatred for the animals. But the thing is, these animals weren't paedophiles; these animals weren't criminals who had to be stopped. They were just animals, and unfortunately, uh, it's probably the case that he, if he was working in an abattoir where you know he was basically being paid to uh, kill and butcher animals, he probably tortured them while he was there as well. Um, I and mean, that was another thing. This guy, he talked to other people about torture more than any other subject. Uh, he would talk about different ways of killing people, and he had a pretty sick imagination. And it, it's became. It, became very clear as I read more about this case and the, the people who knew him that his his internal fantasy life was absolutely filled with just torture. He played over torture scenarios in his head all the time, every day, and uh, it just came to dominate his mind uh, to the point where it became an absolute compulsion that he had to seek out something or somebody to torture and kill. Uh, just to satisfy the edge that he'd programmed himself with. And so, yeah, I, I guess working in the abattoir and killing all these animals and probably torturing them, that probably uh, gave him a, a strong taste for it and uh, probably desensitised him to any kind of empathy that he might feel. And then it was very easy to transfer uh, that cruelty to actual human subjects. But the other giveaway is that if he'd have just said, we're going to execute paedophiles, like, let's just shoot them in the head, you know, trick them, sneak them into a, a, an alley somewhere, and then just shoot them dead and then bury the body. No torture. That would achieve the same aim of protecting kids from paedophiles. The torture wasn't necessary. So, but that was that was there right from the beginning. That's very clear. From, from the murders right from the start, um, torture was always an intended aspect of it, and it wasn't a necessary aspect. So that's another giveaway that John Bunting was never really interested in the social justice in the first place, and that the expression of his sadistic edge was the primary purpose of what he did. But this stuff goes even further in its ironies, uh, onto the last major um, sort of learning point that I've taken from the, the Snowtown murders case, is what I'll call projected hate. And, you know, we're all, we're all familiar with this. Somebody has a, um, a sort of a bigoted or hateful view that they hold themselves. And instead of acknowledging it in themselves, they project it onto other people and then attack those people for supposedly having the very traits that they've got themselves. So, you know, we get examples of this, like uh, people who hate gay people because they have a gay edge themselves and they're, they're ashamed of it. So they... they outwardly express hatred of gay people it's kind of like a cover for the fact that they've got a gay element to themselves and they cover them not just socially but they cover them for themselves blocking out uh, by consciously convincing themselves they hate gay people uh, as a way of suppressing their own gay edge and you can get that with almost anything you get uh, racist people who claim to be anti-racist who go out and commit racist acts there's tons and tons of different examples of this, and we're all aware that this goes on to different extents. And actually, a very clear example of this in the Snowtown murders case is um, John Bunting's main accomplice, who was Robert Wagner, who thoroughly took part in all of the torture and murder of these victims. Now, Robert Wagner, he had been uh, in a relationship with a gay man called Barry Lane, who was one of the victims of the Snowtown murders. Uh, they brutally tortured and killed Barry Lane. And Barry Lane was a pedophile, you know, a, a real pedophile, and 
quite a nasty guy. I wouldn't say he deserved to die in the way that they killed him, uh, but he wasn't a nice man at all. And um, he had groomed uh, Robert Wagner, apparently, around about age 12 or 13. I think Robert Wagner had ended up homeless, his own family were useless. And so he took uh, Robert Wagner in and had a sexual relationship with him, which went on for years. And then Robert Wagner met John Bunting, and John Bunting persuaded him, you're not actually gay. Uh, in fact, I think there's a deleted scene from the Snowtown movie uh, where John Bunting actually says that to him, you're not actually gay, mate. You know? And it uh, persuaded Robert Wagner that Barry Lane had abused him and had manipulated him and groomed him into thinking that he was gay when he wasn't. And so then Robert Wagner and John Bunting, they killed Barry Lane and tortured him to death. So Robert Wagner had had this um, sexual or intimate relationship with Barry Lane for years and then ended up torturing and killing him. And when I read about that aspect of it, I thought, well, hang on. Maybe Robert Wagner was gay or maybe he was bisexual and maybe John Bunting persuaded him th to hate his own gay side and then his way of uh, dealing with that was to torture and murder Barry Lane uh, as a kind of psychological cover um, to persuade himself that he was never actually bisexual in the first place. It's a very interesting uh, dynamic there. And so I also suspect that a similar thing had gone on for John Bunting. His utter hatred of homosexuals and him equating them with paedophiles is uh, kind of suspicious because it's pretty clear that not all homosexuals uh, abuse children. You know, it's, uh, I don't even know if it's any more common than heterosexual abuse of children. And I've never seen any statistics saying it's any worse. But... Um, there are some clues that, that make me suspect John Bunting uh, was partially gay himself and hated that side of himself and then committed these murders as a, a way of covering for it. Um, one of them is that there was so much emphasis in the way he tortured his victims regarding sexuality. It, you know, they, they would commit sexual torture upon the victims. They didn't rape them. I've not read anything that says that he or Robert Wagner... Uh, raped their victims or engaged in any sexual activity while they were killing them. However, they did commit uh, sexual torture acts, which I'm not going to describe the details of them because some of it is really horrific. Um, and it just kind of made me wonder whether, whether John Bunting was committing sexual acts of torture as a substitute for the subconscious desire to rape the victims. Just got me wondering about it. And one of the things that uh, drew me to that uh, suspicion or conclusion, I'm not totally convinced on it, but I strongly suspect it, is that there's a lot of similarities between serial killer John Bunting and another serial killer in America from, around, I think it was the 1970s, called Dean Call, C-O-R-L-L. -L. And this guy was just as much of a monster as um, John Bunting was, possibly even worse. And uh, Dean Cole has so many similarities to John Bunting in how he operated, uh, who he targeted, and so on. Um, Dean Cole was a homosexual serial killer who killed, as, as far as I know, it was dozens of uh, young men. Uh, usually aged between, I think, something like 14 and 21. And, um, I mean, the, the comparisons between him and John Bunting are quite striking in places. Both of them recruited other young, impressionable men to assist in arranging murders and taking part in murders. Um, yeah, both of them had that hypnotic ability to control. Both of them very carefully and meticulously planned and arranged their murders. Both of them were extremely arrogant. I mean, some of these are traits that are common to most serial killers anyway. Um, but one of them is that the forms of sexual torture that were inflicted by both Dean Call and by John Bunting were so similar. And without, I don't want to get into the details too much, but this is an important point, I think, is that 
both of those serial killers engaged in a form of sexual torture that I've not heard of happening anywhere else. And it involved inserting certain types of objects into the penis, which is a form of rape. You know, it's, it's an orifice and it, doing that to somebody is a form of sadistic rape. And John Bunting did that. It was a very unique form of torture that Dean Call did. But the difference between Dean Call and John Bunting was that Dean Call was openly gay, as in he thoroughly acknowledged to himself that he was gay. Um, and he absolutely knew that he had a motive to rape his victims. Whereas John Bunting utterly hated, consciously utterly hated, uh, homosexuals and yet they both engaged in this form of um, sexual torture uh, and I, I, I believe that John Bunting by sexually torturing of victims was engaging in a form of rape and he may have even justified that to himself and even said it to his victims that hey look you know you like to you like to rape kids well now I'm gonna commit a, a sexually painful act against you which is equivalent to rape um, but he didn't want to actually rape them themselves, at least not consciously. Uh, so yeah, I do think there was a rape motive on, on John Bunting's part. And that's interesting because that actually frames him as being the very thing that he claimed to be fighting against. Claimed to be protecting society from uh, sexually abusive people, um, people who rape kids. And yet he ended up doing almost the same thing himself, but in an even more horrific form. Now, he didn't target children, but many of his victims were in their teens. You know, some of them were as young as, I think, 17 or 18. And if I remember rightly, there may have been one of the victims who was as young as 15. I can't remember. But I know several of them were teenagers, um, which is getting close to them being kids. So that's very interesting. Projected hate. Um, John Bunting being the very thing that he claimed to be fighting against, in fact, being even worse than the very thing that he was fighting against, because what he did to these people was arguably just as bad, if not worse, as the crimes that the, the paedophiles had committed themselves. Now, something I quite like about the Snowtown movie is that the filmmakers were right onto this. They knew, they'd figured out, that John Bunting was the thing that he claimed to be against. And uh, they kind of encoded that in the movie quite a lot. I'm not going to go into detail about it because this isn't a film analysis, but you can see I've had this poster from the movie in the background. And some of the details here that kind of seem to give away this theme. I mean, you've got John Bunting stood behind Jamie Vlasakis, uh, who was the youngest apprentice that he had, who he brought into this world of torture and murder. And as you can see from that picture, John Bunting is sort of stepping out slightly or, or stepping behind Jamie, uh, which kind of implies that Jamie's behaviour is privately controlled by John Bunting. But at the same time, there's a scene in the movie where Jamie Vlasakis is raped by his older brother, which is a, a controversial aspect of the whole case. I'm not, from everything I've read, I don't know if Jamie Vlasakis was actually raped by his older brother. Uh, but they put that in the movie anyway as if it was fact. It's one aspect of the movie that I'm not sure about. Um, but from this picture, it almost looks like John Bunting is raping um, Jamie Vosakis from behind. I wonder, if, I wonder if they intended that. And I suspect that they did because there's quite a few scenes in the movie. There's parallels between different scenes that show John Bunting doing the very things that... Um, the paedophile victims did and equating him as being the very thing that he uh, claimed to be fighting so yeah yeah you know just uh, that's the snow town murders for you I just thought to do a little video on this i have been planning for years to do a detailed uh, study on the snow town movie because it's very 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 good but at the same time i hardly ever recommend this movie to people because it's so fucking disturbing uh, it is truly horrific. When I first saw it, I was horrified, and it took me years to watch the film again. Um, nowadays, uh, you know, I've sort of desensitised myself to the movie, and I'm able to study it in more detail. And um, there's a lot of really uh, good stuff going on in there. The, the filmmakers seem to be onto a lot of the things that I've talked about in this video, and they seem to have 
encoded it visually uh, in the movie. So uh, yeah, that's my breakdown of the Snowtown murders. And the reason why this is so important and the reason I want to make a video about it is because John Bunting, uh, as horrific as a man as he was, the, the kind of pattern that he shows in how he becomes a criminal and how he justifies his own criminal behavior th behind the false social justice motive, this is actually a very common thing in society. And most criminals, I mean, I've worked on probation, most criminals, if you actually sit and talk to them, they have actually created some sort of social justice um, belief system uh, whereby their crimes aren't as bad as what they, um, as what the rest of us see them as being, uh, or, or whereby they actually believe their crimes were necessary and were actually the right thing to do. Um, it's amazing how criminals can persuade themselves uh, of this kind of thing. And I, the Snowtown murders is very important for me because it's such a clear example of how people can persuade themselves that what they are doing is the right thing and yet what they're actually doing can be the most horrendous thing possible. Um, and it's not even unique to this case, but this case uh, very clearly gives that example. And it concerns me today that we're seeing a hell of a lot of violence and hatred driven by uh, the desire for justice at some social level. We're seeing, it, we, we're seeing people attacking each other today based upon uh, political party allegiances. We're seeing people who want to physically attack other people because they vote for a different party. Um, and that's gone on throughout history as well. Um, there's so much of this stuff going on. And I think it's really important for people to sit down and take a look at their own social justice um, motives, the things, the issues that they believe in, and stop and ask themselves, am I becoming a violent criminal in service of this cause? Uh, am I getting the tunnel vision that blocks me from realising that I'm becoming a criminal? And it's important for us all to take a look at that. And I've kind of asked myself throughout studying this case and other cases like it, how do you stop yourself? How do you know that you're going down that path and how do you stop yourself? And I think basically, uh, if I had to narrow it down to one thing, it would be the actions that I am considering taking in pursuit of this social justice cause, do those actions progress way beyond what is needed to achieve the cause? Uh, am I beginning to fantasize about violence towards uh, other groups of people who I perceive to be wrongdoers? Um, am I becoming vindictive? Uh, am I becoming angry? Is my anger beginning to replace the, uh, the social justice issue? Um, is my anger in itself becoming uh, the core motive on its own, the expression of that anger? The, is the desire for violence taking over? Um, yeah, I think it's really important that we all take a look at that. Okay, well, that's about it. I hope you learned something from this. hope you enjoyed this. Uh, I've tried to keep this as unsensational as possible. Um, and hopefully I've managed to do that. Well, there is one final thing that I'll say about this as well. Um, <laughs> might be a strange uh, point to finish on, but I wanted to fit it in somewhere and I didn't manage to get around to it. And that is that Regarding uh, these kinds of crimes from uh, people like John Bunting and the likes, um, I'm very interested in the backgrounds of these people, of course. I want to know how they became what they are, because I don't believe anyone is born to be this kind of person. I think they become that kind of person through an unfortunate set of experiences. But uh, as, as a society, we hold adults responsible for their actions, and we don't allow people to say, oh, well, I experienced this when I was a kid, um, I went through that and therefore me committing this horrible act against another person who didn't actually do anything bad to me um, is okay. No, I don't buy that at all. Um, adults are responsible for their own actions. And uh, on that basis, I would say that in extreme cases like this, like John Bunting, um, where the evidence is so strongly against them and the absolute callous cruelty is so strong, in those cases, I really do believe in the death penalty. Absolutely. But at the same time, if John Bunting is still alive in jail, which I believe he is, 
Um, and as far as I know, he hasn't been opening up to people, uh, psychiatrists or psychologists or anybody to talk about all these issues, about what made him the way he is. And it, apparently today he's just as arrogant as he ever was. Um, I think it would be good to somehow get this guy to talk. You know, if somebody could get some sort of interviews with him, some sort of professional, where they could get him to open up, let him rant and rave about all the social justice stuff, about how what he was doing was the right thing and it was protecting society. Let him go on and on and on about that bullshit. And at the same, you know, so that he feels like he's understood and then get him to reveal things about his childhood and stuff and then go and check his actual background to see if those things are true. I think maybe some things could be learned about this guy that would be useful. I mean, one of the big mysteries about uh, John Bunting's uh, early life is that he apparently told a lot of people that he was raped by uh, uh, another boy or a couple of older boys when he was age eight. Apparently, and he, he claimed that he was burned, tied up, burned with cigarettes and raped by these boys at age eight. Now, if that actually happened, then clearly that would uh, contribute to his complete and utter hatred of um, gay people and um, of paedophiles once he was older. And then it would become apparent that in a lot of the, the crimes that he was committing, he would probably subconsciously... Um, substituting his victims for the person he really wanted to kill which was the person who'd raped him and tortured him when he was eight years old um that but i've not heard any any verification uh what from what i've read john bunting made made claim to this to a lot of people but he also told a hell of a lot of lies. He was a very compulsive liar. And it may have just been part of his package of try, trying to falsely justify his own uh, hatred, uh, his own sadism. So that's difficult to tell. It would be interesting to get some background information to find out if that was true. Um, and also John Bunting's parents, apparently, uh, from, from people who knew him and spoke to him, who've been interviewed about the things that he said, uh, apparently his mother was cold and indifferent um, to the point of neglect and she may have even been violently ab abusive of him when he was a kid that would have been a contributory factor no doubt and apparently his father was just like passive uninvolved uh, so it sounds like severe emotional neglect may have went, gone on for John Bunting when he was a child and possibly some physical abuse um, and a possible rape incident but we as far as I know, there hasn't been enough information and research about this. I mean, uh, the book that I read about the Snowtown murders, uh, at one point it stated that nobody's been able to track down John Bunting's real parents. They don't know where they are. Um, it'd be interesting to track them down and say, look, you know, we want to talk to you about what your son did. Let's get some information. Although I suspect that his parents... If they're not dead, then they probably hid away from the world and was like, no, we don't want to get involved in this. We don't want to be exposed to the news media for having created this monster child. OK, so that about wraps it up for this video. I hope you found this uh, interesting and educational. And uh, if you if you want to see more, there's plenty more stuff on my channel here. Most of it's film analysis, but I occasionally do like psychology type videos. And check my other channels on YouTube as well. And go to my website, collativelearning.com. There's lots of articles there. There's lots of videos. Some are free, uh, but most of them are paywall items as well. So, uh, But you won't regret it. If you go order a bunch of them, you'll find there's plenty of good content there. Okay, thanks again for watching. Take it easy, folks. Bye-bye.